It is springtime here on the Retirement Answer Man Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host, and this is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but believe you can rock retirement even in a quarantine, even though it feels really hard. You can do it. And we're going to help you by hopefully helping you set some intentional actions so you can make better decisions. So this is the last week of the month, and every last week of the month, our head retirement coach from the Rock Retirement Club, rockretirementclub.com, <laughs> Beach Walker, BW, is here to talk about some interesting statistics around wellness and longevity and how maybe attitude really does mean a lot more than we think. So we're going to get to that in a moment. And we're also going to be answering your listener questions, which has been the focus this month, but really we do this every week. So if you have a question and you need a little help or a little perspective, go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. That's me. And you can fill out the web form or you can leave an audio question for extra credit. And we'll do our best to answer your question thoughtfully to hopefully help you make a better decision in whatever you're dealing with. So that's rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. Now, next month, May, we have an important theme for the entire month, and that is your retirement assumptions. And it doesn't seem as detailed or as important at first as it really is. There are a lot of assumptions that we make in our planning about life, about inflation, about markets that can have a huge impact on our decision making. And sometimes if we're not thoughtful about it, an assumption that we make without a lot of thought can rob us of opportunities or push to the forefront risks that were unintended. So this is actually a much bigger topic than you would think at first. So we're going to get into our retirement assumptions all next month on the show, but we'll still be answering your listener questions. And as a side note, because I'm told I'm supposed to do it because the team is so proud of all the work that went into it and they did a great job is our advisory firm, our financial planning firm has rebranded as Agile Retirement Management, which is our proprietary process that we use to help people hopefully rock retirement and better reflects what we are laser focused on. And you can go to Agile Retirement Management and look at the site. They did an amazing job. Monkey Dog, Nicole, Tracy, Jamie, Tina. I want to make sure I don't forget anybody. But I think I was in there somewhere doing something. But go to agileretirementmanagement.com and see their amazing work. And with that, let's go to the What's That Mean segment and talk about attitude for a second. Huh? What does that mean? Welcome to the What's That Mean segment. And today's word is attitude. Now, my guess is you know what that means. But there's some interesting research that BW is going to share with us here in a minute. And I think I shared this as one of my top lessons of the show over the next last six years. Attitude isn't everything, but it's a huge component of rocking retirement. That idea of half full or half empty, lemons or lemonade, woe is me, what does this make possible? Without being Pollyannish, attitude is going to be a huge determinant in the quality of your life. So what is attitude? I'm looking it up online. And Google tells me that the noun is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. So your attitude about aging, about the world, about relationships is going to be reflected in your behavior. And so we also have to think about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the attitude or the behavior. Do you have to have the attitude first to adjust the behavior? Or if you start acting the part in the behavior, it affects your attitude? I think those both work, but I think it's an important aspect of rocking retirement. I don't think you can have anything else if you don't have the proper attitudes about things. So my two cents on what that means. And now let's go talk with BW in the Coach's Corner. <laughs> So as we end every month here on the Retirement Answer Man Show, we bring on the head retirement coach of the Rock Retirement Club, Beach Walker. How you doing, Mr. Walker? <laughs> Great, Roger. How are you this month? Are you sheltering? I naturally shelter in place. I'm socially isolated, sometimes not by choice. Just, I guess it might be 
how my friends think of me. But this is a very stressful time, obviously, with the corona disruption, the quarantines. Health and wellness is what we're going to talk about today. And it's probably a really good time to be talking about that because we're dealing with a lot of stress. It is. It is. And I came across a study that I want to share with your listeners that really amazed me. This was a study done at, by some Yale University researchers all the way back in 2002. And it found that people who have a more positive perception of aging live seven and a half years longer than those who had negative perceptions of aging. Now, let that sink in a little bit, Roger. Seven and a half years, that's more than blood pressure, cholesterol levels, exercise, smoking. That's a bigger effect than any of those factors. And that's scary when you think about all the worry about retirement and health as we get older. It sure is. And part of it goes back to how we were raised. I want you to think back to your college days back there at Michigan State. When you were in college, went around maybe your grandparents or other people, what age did you consider old when you were in college? Well, I remember my aunts and uncles and looking at them like they were an alien being. And how old were they? They were like, I don't know. They were probably in their 30s or 40s, 40s, I guess, 40s. Now, today, if I ask you, what's old, Roger? You. What age do you say? Well, no, you're not that much older than I am. I guess 80s. Exactly. And so part of it is our perception needs to be in line with the fact that people are living a lot longer now than they used to. I know my answer to that question about when I was in college, I thought once you hit 60, it was over. You know, that's old age. And I, as I sit here now at 57, I think 60 is quite young. I actually had a meeting a few months ago with a client. She's about 80 and I was whining about I'm 53 and I feel a little old in my body. And she's like, you need to shut up. You're young. <laughs> That's right. Don't you have that mindset? She was basically telling me not to have that mindset that I was old. Exactly. And you can't let every little ache and pain you get make you think about aging. You need to think about how to deal with it, what you're going to do about it. I came across a series of books, three or four of them called Younger Next Year by Dr. Henry Lodge and a patient of his, Chris Crowley, wrote these books. There's a special book for women. There's a book about exercise, but it's Younger Next Year. It's how to go through your mature years and feel a little bit better about yourself each year. So I would recommend that if you want a good place to start to change your own perceptions about aging. And it's not just the perceptions about aging that comes from the study. A lot of this is on a very basic level, half full or half empty, optimistic or pessimistic with the lens that we view things, right? It is. I agree. Almost every issue you face, the, your attitude about it will affect the outcome that you have. This study didn't just find improvements in longevity. It found a boost in mental health, in memory, in balance. So the people who had this positive self-perception about aging had all kinds of great benefit from it, which is probably why they got the extra seven and a half years. And I think about this with obviously the coronavirus and everything going on. I had a client ask me because they listen to the show and I think they're in the club too, actually. Roger, you're always so positive And, you know, how do you do that? And I'm like, sometimes I don't want to appear Pollyannish about things, but I think it's, I really try to focus on what do I do next? Okay. What can I do now? It's a choice, isn't it? And honestly, internally, I was not always this way. I'm not saying I'm definitely this way, but yeah, it's a choice that I have to consciously make. And I have very low points, but I try to manage them and go back to what next. I came across this quote and I forget who came up with the quote, but it's aging is inevitable. Being old is a choice. So that's going to be our mantra this month in the club when, as we talk about health and wellness. Yeah, because a lot of this is Maybe the disruption with the COVID, maybe you know somebody personally that's been impacted. Maybe you're dealing with something physical beyond all of this. And you sort of have to affirm yourself of, I'm going to have a great life anyway. Good way to go through, isn't it? Good place to end this. Good way to do it with you, buddy. We will talk Good next talk month. <laughs> Can we just say to Greens, you're awesome. And we hope you're all doing well. To Harry who? and Aaron. To, oh.
our oh, podcast people. Our production you're team. Like, what? Well, yeah. you said Greens. You said their last name. So we have an awesome production team. We have Michelle. We have Aaron. We have Carrie. But he's really like the owner. He doesn't do anything. So I wish him well. But Aaron and Michelle. Can I hear this? <laughs> you guys are awesome. And we get to Slack, but we don't get to chat. So I hope you guys are doing well. I just figured I'd throw that in there, you know. Yeah, we got to love on our production team. But you don't do that enough. No. Uh, you need to remember. That's your fault. You're the loving one. I'm not one. keeping you on track. Yeah. Ah, shame uh, on me. <laughs> well, we have more questions and answers as we close out April and May is spring. I love spring. That is one bright side through all of this is it's springtime. The weather has been mostly nice. Yeah. Yeah. So what's our first question there, Miss is Rockstar? Our first question is from John, and he says, what are your thoughts on robo-advisors and target date funds? He also adds, during the accumulation phase, I thought they were great. I didn't have to spend time learning where to allocate my investments, and I didn't have to rebalance. I just kept dumping into it, and I never paid attention to it. Rates in a 401k were low for the target fund at 0.09%. Just rough in the date of retirement. Oh, he meant put in the date of retirement and let it run. Without the target date fund, I probably would have been more conservative due to my personal nature. Once retired, it's a different story as I need to have everything separated to enable effective bucket strategies. Thanks for the great podcast. I've enjoyed it for many years. Yeah, well, thanks, John. So I'm not a huge fan of target date funds near or in retirement. So I think to your point, if you're 22, target date's fine. An allocation fund would be better for me. And robo-advisors pretty much accomplish, get a set allocation, rebalance, and stick to it. But in retirement, I think they can lead you astray because they're not geared to distribution. And even if they were, your life is your own unique life and you're going to have your go-go years and your slow-go years and your no-go years in very different sequence than other people. And you have different other resources. So I don't like them for retirement. Because I think it's not going to solve for the problem that you're facing, which is how do I harvest my money to a great life? So yay for accumulation, especially if you're young, no for approaching and in retirement. Our next question is from Michael. He says, why doesn't the long-term care insurance industry offer catastrophic only long-term care? How I would envision this is that one could self-insure a given amount and then buy catastrophic care to insure the rest. For example, I could self-insure the first 150000 on my long-term care, but if I had an event such as Alzheimer's, insurance would kick in for the cost after my expenses exceed 150000 Seems like that would bring the premium down to where it could be afforded by more people. Perhaps you have contacts that could get something happening here. <laughs> Well, I actually asked this question to Steve Kane, who was kind enough to be in the RRC and do a meetup and talk with us on the show, because I agree with you. I think that would be a great idea, that catastrophic coverage. And he said there wasn't anything that he was aware of that's available. And they have tried to get those approved and have not been successful. Because when you have insurance like this, you have to get it approved to be sold in any state that you want to sell it because every state has an insurance board. Any insurance product that's sold in a state has to be approved by that state. And they said they've had questions about that before and certain insurance firms have put together schemes or products to offer it and they couldn't get it approved. And I think the reason is that in aggregate, that's not the main issue. It's most people can't afford the 150,000 exposure. And it's how do you create products for, and maybe that's what the insurance regulators are more interested in is providing insurance for the masses. And they think this fringe product or niche product of catastrophic coverage, that's my best explanation. I agree with you. I personally would prefer to self-insure as much as I can and protect myself against catastrophic, but I am not aware of anything that's available. And we have an audio question from Scott. Yeah, and this question is from Scott. I edited his name out because he gave me his last name too. Calling on, I uh, really enjoy the show. Just a quick question on taking a lump sum benefit versus a fixed pension annuity. I know you've covered this in the past. Basically, how to insulate yourself from sequence of return risk and review that from some of your other guests that you've had on to have a good strategy for that approach because I'm thinking about taking a lump instead of my fixed annuity. So anyways, enjoy the show. All good stuff. And thanks for that. Have a great day. See ya. So do you take a lump sum or do you take the pension? 
So the advantage of the pension is it's a pension. You get a guaranteed paycheck for the rest of your life or maybe the rest of you and your spouse. And that can be very powerful in financial planning and putting all these pieces together. A big component of that that we have to consider is what other assets do you have? It's a weird thing, but the more other assets that you have, the more viable it is to take the pension, right? Because you're going to have a lot of financial flexibility outside of that guaranteed payment. Because once you start that guaranteed payment, you can't stop it and get money. It's an irrevocable decision. So if you have a lot of other financial assets, taking the pension might be a good option, assuming the payouts are at reasonable rates, because you're still going to have a lot of financial flexibility for life happening and all that lumpiness of spending that life is really going to have in retirement. And then on the flip side, if you're underfunded for retirement, meaning you really don't have enough money for whatever reason to fund retirement, you're in a pickle because if you take the lump sum, you're going to need to start using it to pay for life. And then because you're underfunded, you're going to need it to grow. But to get it to grow, you have to take investment risk and you can't afford to lose it. So you're in a pickle. And so best practice is that the more underfunded you are to fund your life, the more you should lean to guaranteed income sources because you can't afford to lose it. And at least you have that. And then how you make life work, you have to figure that out. So if you're underfunded, best practices as well, you may want to have guaranteed income because you can't screw that up. And if you're overfunded, you really have dealer's choice. You can take the lump sum and use it and add it to your financial assets, or you can take the guaranteed payment knowing you have that, which allows your current financial assets to grow maybe more, a little bit more aggressively. But those are the things you want to think through. The hard part with questions like these, Scott, is it's always process strategy tactics. And the way I try to solve this with clients is we go through the process, we build the feasible retirement strategy, and then we model, well, what if we take the pension? What if we don't? And I think that kind of process, and I think you can do this on your own too, Scott, is model it both ways. You know, whether it's using some free software or working with your advisor or building your own spreadsheets, I think the best way to make these kind of tactical decisions, because this is a little bit of a high stakes decision because it's irrevocable. Although if you take the money, and this is another option that you would have to model, if you take the lump sum, Scott, it doesn't mean you can't buy your own pension. Maybe you don't need the funds right now from a pension standpoint. One option to model would be take the lump sum and look at buying a deferred annuity that will turn income on later in life. And that would allow that income potentially to grow. And I think you got to let the facts help lead you because ultimately you're not going to have enough information to make the decision anyway. You're not going to have complete information. I guess that's a better way to say it. But you just have to look at them side by side and overlay what your priorities are. Some people are predisposed to want guarantees. Okay, then that helps tip the scales. Some people are predisposed to having control over assets and have more legacy priorities. Okay, well, then that's going to help tip the scales over what the initial modeling looks like. But I think that's a framework to start to figure out how to think about this. Now, this is not an ad, but in the Rock Retirement Club in our university, we're building the course to sort of build this kind of framework. And that's part of why we're doing it and giving you the tools, hopefully, to help you figure those things out. Nicole? Should we set a smart sprint? I think we should. On your marks, get set. No, you just come say hi. So Nicole is talking to her son, Archer, who has been running around the background. He has a shirt on, but he also has a mask on at the moment. He has like a Zorro mask. A Zorro <laughs> mask. So this <laughs> the is what- black just over the eye. <laughs> and so this is what happens when you are- quarantined and recording yes. and this is zoom this is real life and i've been talking to archer in the background on breaks and recording what's going on in your world i don't know what we're talking about now i just started talking about archer well we need to set an activity i guess Smart for the next sprint. seven days so in the next seven days set a little baby step to answer the question i asked myself a million times what does this make possible what does your particular situation make possible 
where you can start getting on your toes and taking action to have a little bit more joy, take care of a project that you haven't taken care of, start modeling your retirement plan, whatever situation you find yourself in make possible. That's a good question to ask yourself whenever you're dealing with something not of your making. And if you find yourself in a situation where there's a small masked child in your daily work and it kind of made you laugh, I would love to hear about what's making you laugh right now. (laughs) It makes possible for us to share it with the world. That's right. (laughs) I am very hopeful for May. I'm hopeful for some normalcy. But we're recording this so early. Who knows? (laughs) Yeah, we're a little early in recording this, so we may have to revise this. But I, whatever situation we're in, I hope for some normalcy. I don't know if I mentioned this on a previous show. I was in a game shop and they had people in the back and I was there with my son and I heard a guy saying, I'm actually looking forward to work tomorrow. (laughs) I think people are looking forward to getting their routine. So hopefully we are back there or we are soon to be back there. Or do you think at some point all of this will start to feel normal? I guess it might. God, I hope not. But uh, we hope you're handling all this well and that you're making lots of lemonade out of maybe some of the lemons we're getting dealt. All right. Stay well. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our clients. Would not love it. If you took advice from yeah, us, on we, the would show. Not, we would not love it. If you took advice from us on the show, realize this is helpful in an education talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of retirement answer, man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.